This is David Lancaster, the board chair of the uh, Waukesha County Area Technical College Board of Trustees, calling to order the November 10th, 2020 district board meeting. It is uh, five o'clock PM. Um, as many of you are probably noticing here, we've got quite a storm surge going through right now. So we may have uh, internet uh, connectivity issues. So if that does in fact happen, feel free to log off and try to come back on. Um, an alternative to that would be to call in on your phone um, as well. So Jennifer, can you just share that number with everyone uh, so that they've got that option, please? Yeah, so the phone number for the Zoom meeting tonight is 312. 626-6799. Again, that number is 312-626-6799. You will need the meeting ID and passcode. Meeting ID is 999-9547. Again, the meeting ID number is 999-9547-5950. Passcode is 513-699. Again, the passcode 513-699. Very good. Thank you, Jennifer. Again, good evening. Welcome everyone. Thank you for your attendance. Um, and let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, first order of business is the public and staff remarks. Jennifer, do we have any? We have none. Hearing none, let's move on to our next order of business, which is a report out on the Student Government Association uh, by Leo de los Santos Trujillo. Leo, you're up. I'm sorry, before we continue, did you want me to go through navigating tonight's meeting or? just jump in for Leo. Um, you know, I apologize. Yeah, okay, please apologize. do that. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to the uh, November 10th Stormy WCPC District Board virtual meeting. Um, all of your microphones are muted unless you have um, made arrangements with me to address the board. And since we already talked about that, we have none. So I'm not going to go through that. Uh, we'll do a quick introduction of the board members, starting with uh, Chairperson Lancaster. Uh, David Lancaster, Chairperson. Courtney Bauer. Courtney Bauer, Vice Chair. Michael Weeb. Michael Weeb, Secretary Treasurer. Brian Baumgartner. Brian Baumgartner, WCTC board member. Alan Karch. Alan Karch, board member. Tom Maholsky. Tom Maholsky, board member. Katie Ponsloff. Katie Ponsloff, board member. And Julie Valadez. Valadez, board member. Thank you all. And tonight we do have a closed session that will last for about thir uh, for 30 minutes. Once that closed session is over, the board members will come back and make any motions that they are any uh, motions they made in the closed session. And I'll turn it back over to you, Chairperson Lancaster. Great, thanks a lot, Jennifer. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Leo. Sorry for our false start, but uh, now the floor is yours. Okay, can you guys hear me very well? We can. Okay, good. Okay. Let me just, okay. All right, so the Student Government Association is proud to announce that we have added new members to our group. Yami Wu and Tristan Johansson are our senators for the School of Business and Lorena Andrade Trujillo, uh, our new senator for the School of Applied Technologies. In addition, Alyssa Anderson stepped into the role of being a vice president and Jake Muro became our new secretary slash treasurer. SGA is still running events for students with the majority of our events being virtual events. We have used the multiple online tools to provide students with engagement opportunities they can attend from the comfort of their own home. Knowing that many of our students have families, we selected programming that engages the entire family. Many times we see families competing among each other. Uh, SGA has offered events such as Playlist Bingo, Cell Phone Smackdown, and event hosted um, a Netflix watch party. 
SGA also provided, provided a final survival kit for students on campus that included a hand sanitizer, an SGA mask, and a coupon to the hub for a small snack. We will continue our virtual events this semester as well as next semester as our spring lineup is currently being drafted. We are currently working to meet students where they are. So we have taken a larger role in social media with polling students about available times and interest for events. While we cannot see our students up and close and personal, we still are working very hard to maintain connecting and connection to the college. SGA has recently met with the VP of Student Services, Angela Fraser, and the Dean of Student Support, Chris Dale, and would like to thank them for the support and collaboration. We are very hopeful to continue building new relationships and work together to provide students with the best college experience we can provide. SGA has also contributed funds for seating in the bottom floor of the B building last year, along with providing more full down seats for students in the I building. SGA provided book bags and school supplies for the vet's office for new veteran students to make sure they are prepared for the first day of class. Recently, we were presented with a project to work with the DEI office and facilities to provide emergency feminine products for students around campus. We are excited to participate in this project. We have continuously been working with the college to look into other ways that we can support students as many of our classes are online. In conclusion, I would like to give a big thanks to all our SGA centers and board members for continuing to balance school, work, and home life. I am so thankful to have them and and an awesome group of peers that are able to pull off this work, especially throughout these tough times. Thank you for your time. Great. Leo, thanks a lot for your, your presentation. I, you know, from the board's perspective, you guys, like every other organization and, and business, has been impacted by this. And we truly want to commend you and the team for the leadership you guys are showing and your efforts to engage the students and their families and uh, to uh, modify and adapt in some very challenging times. So thank you very much. That's a great report. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next order of business, the WCTC update on college activities, Kaylin. Thank you, Chairperson Lancaster. I'd, I'd like to uh, con congratulate Rodney Nobles, our C CIO and CSO, uh, Justin uh, uh, Kering and uh, Nicole Wilson and Cindy Kawas. Um, Justin is from our financial aid uh, staff and uh, Nicole and Cindy are from our grant staff for submitting to a Lucian, uh, that's WCTC's administrative computing system provider for the PATH campaign and scholarship fund to provide financial assistance to students uh, experiencing finan financial hardships related to COVID. Uh, 25 schools uh, were chosen to receive $20,000 to make awards of $500 to $2,000 to individual students affected by COVID. And WCTC was selected as one of those colleges. So I want to thank those staff very much for their work. They put this together very quickly and got it submitted uh, to uh, Aleucian and uh, very proud that we were one of the 25 um, that uh, received uh, these dollars for our students who are very much in need. Uh, next, uh, the student services uh, and develop and student services, student services development staff and marketing have been working very hard putting together a virtual uh, graduation. Uh, some of us have already gone through the videoing uh, at Magic uh, Productions. Graduation is set for uh, Saturday, December 14th at 10 a.m. Uh, that's really when it's virtually turned on. So, uh, and Jennifer will be placing a link on your calendars uh, to uh, see the graduation. The great thing about the, the virtual access to graduation is that it's not real time. And if you are interested in watching it, you can do so at any time uh, after Saturday or during Saturday and for however long you want. Um, Chris Dayoud emailed me and uh, said that he estimated it was 90 minutes, but you can hit pause and go get popcorn if you need to. So. Uh, 
Thank you for Chris for that uh, uh, helpful hint and maybe <laughs> going through the virtual graduation. But again, it's really uh, up to uh, each of you if you would like to uh, log in and see uh, the graduation and for how long as, as you would like. So uh, the, uh, the next thing is that uh, my last thing actually is uh, I want to thank uh, the WCTC Foundation Board. Uh, they really surprised me at their last board meeting. They awarded a tribute scholarship in my name uh, for in honor of my retirement to a student in WCTC's leadership development program. The scholarship will be awarded in fall of 2021. Um, and again, it was quite a surprise and I wanna publicly thank them uh, for this honor. It was greatly appreciated and I totally was surprised. So I thank them very much for that honor. Thus ends my report. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thanks, Kaylin. Some uh, some neat things there. So, and I'm definitely anxious to see uh, what the end result is of uh, how magic makes everybody look very, very professional and articulate and intelligent on uh, on a virtual basis. So, should be good. I was I was more worried with the ten pounds off, Dave. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of us. Very good. Okay, next order of business is the approval of the consent agenda items. Um, at this point, does any board member have any agenda items listed that you'd like to bring forward for discussion? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Michael Weeb, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Thank you, Michael. A second? Alan Cart, second. Thank you, Alan. Jennifer, roll call, please. Chairperson Lancaster? Aye. Courtney Bauer? Aye. Michael Weeb? Aye. Brian Baumgartner? Aye. Alan Karch? Aye. Tom Mahalski? Aye. Katie Tonswa? Aye. And Julie Valadez? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to our action items. Uh, first action item this evening is the resolution to modify the 2020-2021 budget. Jane Kittle and Christine Goals. Good morning. Um, I'm gonna take this one this evening. Christine is on the line, but not feeling very well today. So I'm gonna do the presentation. Um, it's basically on the board packet on page 30 is the memo and the Budget is modified a couple of times during the year. This is a fairly routine activity that we do. You know, budgets are estimates that we make in well in advance of the year beginning. And then as we go through the year, we learn things and we bring modifications to you as we learn things that are significant. So today's modifications um, are all related to revenue changes. So that's a, it isn't always the case, but is an interesting twist tonight. So if you look at the top, the first bullet, we are modifying the tax levy that's just modifying the budget to match what the board approved at the October board meeting for the levy, um, both in the general fund and the debt service fund. The numbers are on page 32 of the board packet. And I'll walk through the narrative. And if you wanna look at the numbers at the same time, um, you can you can do that on your own. Um, the state aids are modified just slightly. That is just new information we got from the state on what personal property tax relief aid was going to be, and it's slightly less than what we had estimated. And then the big dollars come in that third bullet. Um, the federal CARES Act funding that is coming our way is in two pieces, and the first piece is the half of it goes to our students in direct aid to students. And this is awarded to students who have, um, who can show that they have suffered as a result of the impact of COVID on their study. And we have $525,629 is half of the award that is available to students. So that's being modified in the special revenue non-operating fund. That's where student financial aid flows through that fund and it just passes from us on to students. Then the other half of that comes to the college 
in the form of institutional aid. And in addition to that, the governor awarded state-related CARES Act funding that passed through his office and came to the technical colleges as well. So those amounts are all impacting the special revenue operating funds, federal revenue line item, and the capital projects federal revenue line item. So if you page down, um, Kristen, to 30, page 31 is the resolution that we're asking for your approval tonight. And page 32 is what I just talked through in numbers, for those of you who can see it more clearly in numbers than in narrative. Are there any questions around this budget line? Hey, Jane, just a question on the, um, on the 525,000 that is allocated for, for uh, student aid distribution of students. Is the expectation a requirement that all of that would be dispersed in the academic year? Or if not used, does that flow into a, a different type of aid um, This Good question, very good question. Um, there are a lot of strict rules around these uh, CARES Act funds and the student amounts have to be dispersed by April. Um, we were awarded the federal CARES Act funds in April of 2020. So we only have until April of 2021 to spend them. So we do need to disperse them to students. We are on track to doing that. So I would say at this point, we've been monitoring them monthly. We post updates on our website as to the distribution of these funds. And uh, we are on track to spend them before the deadline in April. Great. And then is, do you find the demand to be overwhelming, steady? Um, we have, when we put, the, we put the word out at the beginning of each semester that there are dollars available. And at that point, there's usually a flurry of applications right away after we make those announcements. And then it wanes off as the uh, term goes and then we make a new announcement and it, and it comes back to us. Um, I, financial aid is really a much better um, group to respond to that question as to what the needs of our students are. There are a lot of needs. These dollars have some very specific eligibility requirements. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said before, we are not going to have a problem distributing these dollars. So the need is there. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions for Jane? I just have one follow-up question. Um, is most of that funding going to tuition or were there other things that 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 money is used for? Those dollars go directly to the student to use in whatever manner they need them for. So the dollars are uh, going to students if they have need for childcare, if they have need for food, if they have need for rent, they can use these dollars in wherever their area of greatest need is. Okay, and my last question is, is there an equity component to that um, in getting the word out? Is there collaboration to make sure that maybe a student that might not, um, you know, making sure underserved have gotten the information and that there's a, you know, diverse applications being submitted? Um, yes, again, this might be a better question for student services. So if someone else wants to speak up and respond, but um, from my perspective, yes, student services, student development, and um, the Multicultural Resource Center assisted in getting the word out to students and letting students know that these dollars were available. We wanted to spread the word just as widely as we possibly could. So everyone receives um, and received email communications, go, went to all students, um, regardless of, you know, as long as they were registered, they received an email communication. But I do know word of mouth, people were passing the word around as well. Yeah. Oh, and I just got, we did send text messages to students on this topic as well. Someone just sent me a quick reminder, so thank you. Um, we did send out text messages specifically to enrolled students as well. So we worked very hard to make sure that people, that the students knew that the dollars were available. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And again, good work on being the work involved in getting those funds and distributing them. That's, that's great to hear. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, Jane. 
At this time, do we have a motion for approval? Brian Baumgartner, I move to approve. Alan Cart, second. Thank you, guys. Jennifer, roll call, please. Chairperson Lancaster? Aye. Courtney Bauer? Aye. Michael Weave? Aye. Brian Baumgartner? Aye. Alan Karch? Aye. Tom Mahalski? Aye. Katie Ponsbach? Aye. And Julie Valadez? Julie? Julie? Sorry, I said aye. Oh. I <laughs> aye. Thank you. Yeah. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next action item, resolution to submit a request for approval for building V. Jeff. Good evening, Jeff Leverance, Facilities Director, WCTC. And tonight uh, I'm here to ask you for your approval to send a board resolution to the state so they can review this project. And this is for the V building. If you recall from last uh, meeting in October, Greg West and Mike Shields talked about the building uh, out on the near the EVOC track. Uh, Kristen, if you go to, yes, thank you. <clears throat> and you'll see on this plan right here that there is a building up in the far right-hand corner um, that would become this V building. And this was part of the five-year plan. Now that we, WCTC has a, a many rules that we have to follow regarding new construction. So you can see that in FY17, we did a first phase and in FY19, we did a second phase and in FY21, we're planning to build this third phase. WCTC can only build new construction once every two years for up to $1.5 million without going to a referendum. So these are operate, uh, this is capital funding that would build these functions. So with this, um, if you can go to the next slide, Kristen, We've been doing a lot of uh, um, estimating of costs on this. And you can see that the stuff we've got shown in green right here is the firing range. That is the building we're gonna plan to build in FY21. Um, we don't think we can build this entire building in one year for $1.5 million. And a big part of that is both the utility costs to get up to this area, and also when we did soil borings up there, the footings have to be made larger and different to maintain the weight of this building. Now, when we talked about this uh, at the PEC level, we decided that the firing range was more important than the two additional classrooms right now, because the firing range, as Jane mentioned at the last meeting, was losing money in its current location. And part of that is, is the difference between operational funding, which leases are required to use, and capital funding, which is what we would spend to build this new building. So Jane, if you're available, if you'd like to talk a little bit about those two different funds, I'd appreciate it. Sure. I thought it would be a great opportunity um, to speak to the fact that our, our different funding me mechanisms are very important when it comes to our capital projects and our building construction. And many of you in your businesses don't deal with that like we do in government. So I'd like to explain that just a bit. The um, lease that we pay for the current um, building, as Jeff mentioned, is part of our operating budget. And that is the general operating, the, the large budget that we run the, the college on that we instruct our students and we serve our students out of that budget. Um, the building of the building comes out of our capital budget and that is funded by the borrowing that we do and any fund balance that remains from prior investment earnings and things from prior years that builds up in the fund balance. So that funding mechanism is very different than the operative which is funded by student tuition, by property taxes, and by um, federal and state dollars, institutional revenue. So the, the very day we, are, um, we leave that lease behind and the operating costs around that rented building, we can reallocate those operational dollars to other high priority needs the, that very day. Those are not dollars that are used for this construction. So when we talked um, 
at our last meeting briefly about return on investment. For WCTC, the return on investment is very different than what you might be used to because we don't use those operating dollars for our construction. The construction would be out of our capital projects dollars, our borrowed dollars, and those are paid back within five years um, with tax levy dollars from a completely separate fund. So the dollars in the operation, operational budget would be available for other needs immediately upon release of the lease. So I wanted to clarify that and, and I take questions around that too, if, if you have any. Okay, if not, Kristen, if you could go to the next slide then please. Any questions about the V building and what we're planning to do with that space? Okay. I, I have a follow-up question from, uh, from a previous meeting. Is it still the plan that the public won't be able to access the firing range any longer? That is correct. They, at the, at the, this new V building, they would not be able to participate uh, with the public at this location. Okay. And what is the communication plan for that? What, what have we communicated and, and how? So there's no surprises. Has there been some uh, development on that? Brad, are you available to address that? Brad Piazza, are you out there? Oh, did we lose him? Okay. I don't know all of the details on that, uh, Mr. Weeb, but Brad uh, initially did uh, a message that we were going to be closed for the uh, COVID restrictions that we're under. And if this moves through tonight, I believe Brad is planning to do another communication, letting the members know that we will be closed during COVID and with this new building, it will not be open to the public in the future. I don't know any more details than that, but that's what I do know at this point. Okay, and I'm sure with that, probably some some um, alternate suggestions because we had talked about there's firing ranges that there's other ones that the public can access so it's not like it's not we're not of having that availability in our in our county or in our city anymore it can be done somewhere else that's correct okay thank you um at this point in time, is there any additional questions on this? Thank you for the explanations on that, Jane. Thank you for a clarification. Is there any additional questions? Um, Jennifer, you, if you can make note that we will um, move forward with action on this subsequent to um, a confirmation of the communication plan from Brad. And at this time, I would entertain a motion. Katie Ponsoff, motion to approve. Thank you, Katie. Do we have a second? No, no, no. I'm sorry, did you get that, Jennifer? Who is our second? I'll second Tom Waholski. Thanks, Tom. Um, Jennifer, roll call, please. Chairperson Lancaster? Aye. Courtney Bauer? Aye. Michael Weeb? Aye. Brian Baumgartner? Aye. Alan Karch? Aye. Tom Mahalski? Aye. Katie Ponsloff? Aye. And Julie Valadez? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Chairperson Lancaster? Uh, yes. This, this is Kaylin. Um, I just want to make sure that we can go ahead and submit this resolution uh, to the state board. Uh, and you had asked pending the communication plan um, be, because of timing that we have to get to the state board. Yeah, Kayla, um, let me clarify. We, well, I'll just clarify for you. Not pending, but we have an expectation just for communication on what the communication strategy is. 
So the action is to move forward. I did also get a message from Brad that he can hear everything that's going on, but when he tried to speak, we weren't able to hear him. So he is listening to what was going on here. Okay. Any additional clarification needed on intent? So Chair Lancaster, sorry, um, but would you like that communication plan provided to the full board um, yeah. as, as soon as possible? That would be wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to uh, next action item. Uh, resolution to submit a request for approval for Building H-230 Assimilation Lab. Jeff, you're still up. Okay. Um, good evening again. This is for the HPS Lab project, which Michelle Nelson talked about last meeting. Uh, this will be, there are two currently two simulation labs that are enclosed and a third simulation lab that is open. This will be to enclose that third simulation lab add another simulation lab. So there will be four labs and then put in three new control rooms, one for each simulation lab. So the simulation lab, especially during the COVID uh, situation here has become more needed because there are not as many practicum sites for nursing students to go to, or they're in less number of students at a time at the practicum sites. So they're using more of these HPS labs for it. So with that, the budget on this project is $500,000. And we would like to uh, ask for your approval to send it to the state board uh, with your resolution. If I may, I have a question. Um, my question is, my understanding about new buildings and not to exceed two a year, one a year or one every other year and not to exceed uh, 1.5 million. So how does that work with these two buildings? Is this because it's a remodel, it isn't included, it doesn't count? How does that work? You're exactly right. New construction means any new square footage. And that's where we fall under that two year $1.5 million restriction for remodeling of existing space. If we're not adding new square footage, it doesn't uh, affect that uh, requirement. So we are able to do as many projects as we can afford to do or need to do uh, that, are, that don't add new square footage. Thank you. And, and this 1.5 million cap, is, is that increased based on cost of living annually or is that fixed? Uh, it's been fixed for quite a few years now, probably 10 years or more. It's been fixed at 1.5 million. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. Any additional questions for Jeff? Very good. I'll entertain a motion. Tom Holsky, I'll move to approve the H building. Is that what we're calling H2, the remodeling of H230? Alan Cart, second. Thank you, gentlemen. Jennifer, roll call, please. Chairperson Lancaster? <clears throat> Aye. Courtney Bauer? Aye. Michael Weeb? Aye. Brian Baumgartner? Aye. Alan Karch? Aye. Tom Mahalski? Aye. Katie Conswa? Aye. And Julie Valadez? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Jeff, Thank to you. complete your trifecta here, uh, you're on the resolution to submit a request for approval for building H Mother's Room dash or slash individual restroom. Good evening. Yeah, this is to talk about um, <clears throat> adjacent to the uh, HPS lab expansion, we would like to build a mother's room and a individual restroom. And at the last board meeting, Ms. Ponsloff asked a question about uh, the prefab rooms. So I did do some more research and they do make ADA acceptable ones now. Next slide, please. So I asked for some pricing on it. And you can see that the pricing on this with delivery and setup would be about $24,000. Uh, so with that, if you go to the next slide, I did for the W building, we're currently doing a mother's room and a uh, individual restroom. 
And what I didn't mention about that mother's room, that prefab mother's room, is it does not have any sink or water capabilities into it. And it doesn't have any true ventilation. All it's got is taking recycled air from the hallway, going through, and then putting it back into the hallway. So with this, you can see on the screen here, when we did the work that we're currently doing down at the mother's room and individual restroom at the W building, the 48,000 covered building both of those rooms that do include water in both rooms and it does include a true ventilation system. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, 48,000 is what the construction cost was. We do have a few other costs involved with architectural fees, energy management, security, those kind of things. So the price actually came to about uh, $34,000 per room for water and HVAC in each of those spaces. So with that, this next project that we're asking for, we do have a budget of 150,000 for it, but the estimates we've received for this work that's gonna be next to the HPS lab are around the 70 to $75,000 mark. So we should be pretty similar to what's going on down at the W building. So in my personal opinion, I still think we're better off to build these rooms where we have the water and HVAC included into them rather than having the prefabbed uh, mother's room stand alone and then still have to build an individual restroom. So next slide, please. So and this will be the location, uh, which is right across the room from them. You can see they're, they're small little rooms that will be uh, taking up uh, what's currently a display cabinet. We will not affect any classrooms or hallway space whatsoever. Next slide, please. Any questions regarding these two rooms? So Jeff, thank you for the due diligence. So in, at the end of the line, we'll be able to get what it is we're after, more functionality with water and a fairly high confidence level that will still be under budget. Correct. Good. <clears throat> Any additional questions for Jeff? No, I just appreciate the follow through. And I think uh, your your recommendation on having water within the area seems pretty obvious for infection prevention purposes. Yeah, or easier than walking to a restroom and then washing it up in a restroom, so. Mm -hmm. This is Michael Weeb, so I make a motion to approve the request for approval for building H mother's room, individual restroom, as Brian, ba Brian Baumgartner, I would second that. Thank you. Jennifer, roll call, please. Chairperson Lancaster. Aye. Courtney Bauer. Aye. Michael Weed. Aye. Brian Baumgartner. Aye. John Karch. Aye. Tom Halski. Aye. Katie Ponswap. Aye. Valadez. Hi. You're good. Motion carries. Thank Katie, you. thank you for the question. Jeff, thank you for the due diligence. Okay, last action item. Resolution to adopt amended Wisconsin Code of Ethics for public officials and employees. Technical College Section 19-41 through Section 19-59. Kaylin. Yes, that's me back again from last month uh, because I forgot to include a very important individual on the uh, individuals that uh, have to submit economic interest statements. And that would be our CFO, Dr. Jane Kittle. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, it was an oversight and thank you to Jennifer for bringing it to my attention. Uh, so we will resubmit uh, her name and she gets to complete the economic interest. She was actually quite happy that she wasn't on there, but I told her she had to be. So um, I apologize for the oversight, um, uh, but I do need a motion from the board uh, to approve all of the individuals that are on the list that are contained uh, along with Jane. So, so Jane, as, as mentioned in a previous meeting, it, it is quite important that the CFO be covered by this. So we hope you don't uh, mind disclosing all your holdings in foreign lands. To, yes, uh, if you insist, I guess, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, entertain, uh, entertain a motion, please. 
Katie Ponslaff, motion to approve. Thanks, Katie. Second. Brian Baumgartner, I'll second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chairperson Lancaster. Aye. Courtney Fowler. Aye. Michael Weed. Aye. Brian Baumgartner. Aye. Alan Karch. Aye. Tom Mahalski. Aye. Katie Ponslaff. Aye. And Julie Valadez. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, presenters. Okay, let's move on. We've got a couple of exciting presentations this evening. So let's open up with the Corporate Training Center, uh, Russ Roberts and Jim Drager. Thank you, Chairperson Lancaster. Uh, this is uh, Jim Drager, Director of the Corporate Training Center. Uh, Russ is in class tonight, so I'll be taking care of things from here, moving on out. Um, before I get into the specifics of uh, uh, FY20 Corporate Training Center, I want to take a little bit to talk about the Applied Technology Center. The Applied Technology Center, um, according to WTCS board policy, we have to submit a yearly ATC report. Uh, the ATC is the Q building uh, or the Quadrachi Center. And this report is in your board packet and details the overall operational structure, business plan, participant feedback, and usage of that building. Uh, specifically, the Corporate Training Center and Small Business Center are located in the ATC with the goal to support, enhance further economic development in our district. CTC focuses specifically on the customized training and professional development workshops. In the Small Business Center, the goal is to move entrepreneurs from idea to launch phases. Um, we do survey our participants and we have a customer, we have customer satisfaction results from over 5,000 participants in FY20. The feedback is overall 99% uh, satis satisfied. Uh, participants find the info useful, the program challenging, instructors, professional organized and would recommend this to others. Um, the operational guidelines from uh, Board Policy 705 require 75% of all activities in the ATC uh, serve an external audience, relate directly to workforce development, and support uh, economic development initiatives. And we have exceeded those guidelines in FY20. Uh, you can see the pie chart breakdown in that report. It's page six of the report. Um, and then on page seven of that report, it details uh, the list of all the events in FY20. So the Corporate Training Center and the Small Business Center operate within the ATC guidelines to serve as the economic driver for the district. And now I'm gonna dive a little bit into the details of those metrics to give you some of those specifics. I don't know if the ATC report needs approval from the board or not. Um, I'm not certain, but that's something we do submit to the state office. Um, so with that, I can move into the specifics of the Corporate Training Center. Um, you can see here um, that we had almost 180 Corporate Training Center events, 120 contracts serving over 80 businesses, almost 60 workshops, over 4,200 participants in those events. Uh, the Small Business Center had over 1,000 registrations and 600 courses. In all, we, uh, we added to the added 135, just over 135 FTEs, and that uh, directly impacts our amount of state funding. Um, the overall FY20 revenue was almost 2.9 million um, for for the uh, for the contracts um, through the corporate training center. But it's really important to note that that amount also includes dual enrollment and high school transcripted credit contracts. Those contracts have a net zero margin and, and account for most of that, uh, most of that 2.9 million. So if we go to the next slide, I can speak specifically to the CTC operations. Um, and by CTC operations, um, I'm, I mean contracts and workshops. So I know there's a lot of information on here. I'm gonna try to break it down for you. That top graph shows the net margin of CTC operations over the last three fiscal years. Our goal is to hit 50% margins on our contracts and workshops to cover the cost of our sales team. Um, 
that sales team is out there in the community, uh, selling the training, helping be that driver. And you can see we, we've hit our goal over the past three years. And in FY20, we actually had a 64% margin on our contracts. But how does that translate into actual dollars? And you can see that in the bar graph beneath there. The blue part of the bar graph shows and indicates the gross revenue of corporate training center contracts and workshops. On average, over the last three fiscal years, we're hitting close to about or over $700,000 in gross revenue. Now, the net on that is a 50% margin. So our net take on that gross revenue is roughly around that, um, you know, $350,000, $400,000 mark. Um, so that's, the blue is the gross revenue from the corporate training center. The top of each bar and the line going across indicates the actual operating expenditures of the corporate training center of department 61. Those actual yearly expenditures are roughly about $1.1 million. It fluctuates from year to year. So when you remove that gross revenue from those actual expenses, you get the the gray part or the pardon me, the green part of each bar, which is the general fund support for our for the corporate training center. And this support helps cover the operational costs salary and fringe benefits of non-sales staff to manage the contracts, the workshops, the SBC courses, um, to manage the contracts for uh, dual enrollment and high school transcripted credit. Just in FY20, those contracts served over 4,400 dis district high school students. Um, so the revenue from the uh, CTC operations and the general fund support are really helping us meet the economic needs of, of the district. Our goal within the department is to increase that blue bar. We want more revenue from CTC and to decrease that general fund, fund support. And we have numerous initiatives in FY20 that I'll go over in the next slide to kind of talk about our plan to raise additional revenue. And that'll be on the, on the next slide, please. Uh, pri primarily one of our initiatives coming up in this new fiscal year is to rebound from COVID. Uh, we estimated uh, almost $220,000 lost in gross revenue from canceled contracts and workshops that translates to almost $120,000 in net revenue, um, 30, 37 canceled workshops, uh, 12 canceled criminal justice workshops. We had 23 canceled contracts. Uh, 14 of those have been rescheduled, but the goal is to get all of those rescheduled in the upcoming fiscal year. We also have some exciting work with Ozaki and Waukesha counties. Uh, we're doing some leadership training with Ozaki County. We we're about to add Jefferson County to that as well. We have some exciting lean training with Waukesha County and partnering with the county director there who oversees the training of 17 different departments. So really the, it, the skies are the limit. Uh, we've also are close to entering into contracts with Generac to substitute their lean programming with CTC lean, lean programming. In addition to that, some project management and tech training contracts as well. Uh, we apply for uh, workforce advancement training grants every year. And sometimes companies don't get into that application process soon enough. So we're looking to plug them into fast forward grants uh, just as, as a way to, to locate additional grant funding for um, for more contract training. So that's an exciting initiative. We're also looking to revamp our leadership program. It's our flagship, flagship training. Uh, we really want to reorganize it to be more tiered, include and potentially include an intro to more lean programming. So we kind of build companies through an entire program. Also to look to move it or, more online. Um, also exciting for FY21 is partnering with area chambers of commerce. We really wanna work with them as a vendor to provide training opportunities to their members, emphasizing the corporate training center as offering those hard skills and those uh, certifications. Um, in, in building off of that is, is really focusing, focusing on how we can take the participants in the 
corporate training center and provide a pathway to other learning programs in the college. So where are we taking students from credits to degrees? We have an exciting program with a local company, JW Speaker, where students are earning PLC credits to plug them into other learning programs. We're opening discussions with other learning departments on campus to do the exact same thing. We're gonna continue our work with area school districts, administrative training with Elmbrook, Orange Belt training with Menominee Falls, and we're gonna continue customizing. We have some hazmat training with Greater, project management with Bruno, uh, Spanish for manufacturing ma uh, Spanish for manufacturing managers uh, with Create a Pack. That's that's where our bread and butter is is offering that customized training. And on the workshop workshops front, uh, more timely workshops. Ho hopefully, we'll get some contract contact tracing workshops set up this spring, as that's becoming a, a prevalent field as well. Um, so the Corporate Training Center, the Small Business Center, we continue to be economic drivers developing the district workforce. We're excited about these upcoming initiatives uh, to increase revenue back to the college. And I, I'd love to answer any questions you may have on either corporate training or the ATC. Jim, this is Dave Lancaster. Thank you very much mm -hmm. uh, for the presentation. I, it's always fascinating to see the margins that you're able to post on your your gross revenue there so I we, we agree well, how do we find a way to to increase that that revenue line um, you know you mentioned in, in here the the work that you're doing with Ozaki and our potential work we're doing with Ozaki and and Waukesha counties um, as well as the chambers is there an opportunity to to integrate that message uh, more aggressively with like the business alliance Absolutely. Uh, we, we do partner with the Business Alliance. We are active with them. I was, um, we uh, work with them and, and market through their communications um, and, and, and are part of, of their operations. I was just focusing more on what new was coming in. Um, so, but yeah, we, we do market that through the Business Alliance as well. Okay, thanks. I have a question, if I may, uh, regarding your initiatives, you want to increase the revenue, which is wonderful. That's a good thing to do. Uh, I was wondering if you had a goal in terms of percentage that you want. To I mean, our, our, our goal is always to hit, to hit our 50% margins. We really want to focus on making sure that we're getting our money to, or raising enough revenue to cover those sales expenditures. But I think with, with a lot of these, I think we could, we could see that gross revenue. As long as we continue to rebound from, from COVID, we could see that tick up, uh, specifically with programs like Generac May, hopefully five or 10% in the upcoming fiscal year. And, and do you, I'm new on the board, so is this like an annual report or a quarterly report? Well, how often do you come to us? Uh, once a year, sir. Once a year. Um, and this is the first year that we've included that second slide to kind of show um, margins, uh, gross revenue, and general fund support. T typically, we've we've uh, just reported out the rev uh, the total gross revenue. So we just wanted to break it down to give a clear picture of of the need for the training center to increase revenues with the help of general fund support. Well, I look forward to next year's report and I hope you hit your 10%, I really do. Yeah, me too, fingers crossed, right? Uh, Jim, this is Kaylin. Um, just to, uh, uh, if Brad was on, uh, he might uh, add on to this, but I won't go into the, all the histories of how the ATCs came about, uh, but they were uh, specifically designated by uh, the state uh, for colleges to have an ATC. Uh, we were one of the colleges that, that did that. Um, and it does require a annual report to the board and a submission of uh, the information to the state office. Uh, so um, hope I helped you out there a little bit with the requirements. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylin. The, the, the report is in the board packet and we plan to submit it before for the end of the calendar year. I have a question. Um, 
around that cut continued customizing. Um, I was wondering a couple of things. If you do a needs survey, um, as you look at expanding the, that customizing, do you have any data that you collect for um, gathering information on what might be needs in the, in the community around economic development? Um, we don't have, oh. okay. I'm sorry, please continue, no. I'll, I'll ask one question at a time, let's go ahead. Sure. Um, I, I've not seen any, I've only been in the role for about six weeks and I haven't seen any hard data on, on, on any survey results. Um, it's mostly from us building, building partnerships with the local organizations and businesses and identifying what keeps them up at night and, and really going out there and, and deli delivering them a quality product that'll, that'll help them meet their economic needs. Um, but I, I love that suggestion of, of reaching out to, on a, on a more district-wide scale, to folks that we don't interact with to see what those needs would be. But thank you for that. Yeah. And then um, you mentioned, uh, I believe if I heard you correct, uh, Spanish language uh, training for managers. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that you're continuing um, to have goals towards in the customizing of um, your offerings and having more diversity and um, other languages in the offered for the leadership trainings? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's kind of a two-way street. Um, sometimes manufacturers or companies reach out to us and say, we'd like ESL training for our, uh, for our, um, for our staff. For our workers and then we couple that with with spanish for the managers as well so folks can meet in the middle right and so we've we've had some interesting success with that at create a pack in oconomowoc and we're looking forward to continuing that with healing manufacturing in waukesha so um, that's something also that um linda gordy's uh, staff are really excited about to help to help with as we uh, is specifically with Spanish for the for the managers, so it's a lot of buzz around that as well. That's wonderful. I'm excited to hear that. Um, I think there might be some potential uh, for the entrepreneurial side too. I know that there's a great affinity for um, entrepreneur trainings and um, within the Hispanic community in Spanish language. So I'm excited to see you guys uh, continue to expand your your customizing. Of of what you offer and grass on the good feedback that you guys get of the high quality that you provide. Thank you. Any additional questions for Jim? Very good, Jim, thank you very much. We appreciate your, uh, the of your presentation. Thank you. Good night, thank you. Okay, next presentation, um, our 30, 60, 90 DEI plan. Uh, as presented by Sherry Simmons. Sherry, welcome. Yes, thank you, Chairperson Lancaster, and good evening, everyone. I'm Sherry Simmons, the Chief Diversity and Compliance Officer, and presenting with me will be Rolando De Leon, who's our Diversity Coordinator, and Jennifer Hinn, who is a, an Administrative Assistant in Career Connections, and they'll introduce themselves as they um, come to their slides in the presentation. But I just wanted to um, show the why that we're doing um, DEI and making it a focus of the institution, um, we are committed to intentionally constructing an inclusive, diverse, and equitable campus. And um, the ways that we're going to do that are going to be explained through this plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanted to give you um, the structure of the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Compliance um, that formed on July 1st. Um, so I am supervised by Angela Fraser, author, the Vice President of Student Services, and Dave Brown, who's the Vice President of Human Resource Services. And the reason for that is because we touch all points, whether that's students and employees. Um, so Angela being on the student side, Dave being on the HR side, employee side, making sure that we touch all those spaces um, from a total perspective. And so Rolando Daly on the Diversity Coordinator, Dennis Jackson, who's the Compliance Coordinator and Title IX Coordinator, and Dura Taramino, who's our Multicultural Resource Center Specialist, all serve with me in the Office of DEIC. Next slide. Our mission is to advocate for members of the WCTC community while emphasizing the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and compliance in promoting learning and working at WCTC. 
And our vision is to recognize diversity, equity, inclusion, and compliance as core institutional values that drive decision-making, resource allocation, and the development of policies and practices. It's also a place where diverse students, faculty, and staff are recruited, retained, and supported. Next slide. And our strategic priorities are to be a strong advocate for DEI and compliance, to introduce DEI and compliance into the systems, structure, and culture of the college, to lead and provide expertise and leadership on diversity, equity, inclusion, and compliance matters for planning and implementation, to develop and revise policies and practices to create a diverse campus that is equitable and inclusive, to provide resources for infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion into the curriculum, and to remain committed to providing a non-discrimination discrimination and harassment-free working and learning environment through compliance efforts. And so this starts our DEI action plan. And so again, um, Rolando and Jennifer are gonna come and help explain that, but just we broke it down into five themes and we'll go over those themes with you and then list the objectives that each of those themes will house. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. As, as Sherry mentioned, my name is Rolando De Leon, Diversity Coordinator at WCTC, oversee the Multicultural Resource Center. As Sherry mentioned, one of the themes for the 30-60 day uh, uh, theme and the plan uh, for the 30-60 day is um, communication. And one of the things that we have in process right now is inter integrating the DEA, DEI efforts, updates into overall WCTC internal and external communication plan. Uh, such as an impact magazine, college perspective, website, and et cetera. Uh, one of the goals is this, as you can see, there's a grid here with 30 day, 60 day, 90 day. And this one is one of the efforts that we see that will probably take us about 90 days, 91 days and plus. Um, the other one is to create a logo and a brand to brand the office of DEI, a strategic plan and a directive goal. Again, this one is also a goal that we see that's gonna take us about over the 90 day mark. Um, and also new employee onboarding. Um, this one was marked as 30 day and something that we're currently working on. Next slide, please. We have our next theme of curriculum. Um, and so in our planning phase is to develop criteria for review of the curriculum that includes inclusive language and to identify any systemic issues and what and how is taught. And one of the things that we're working on um, at a system level with the WTCS system is that a couple of us have been involved in a criminal justice program reform, as if you would say. I um, mean, just looking at the criminal justice program across the 16 tech schools and seeing how DEI can be infused into that curriculum and then moving from um, criminal justice into other disciplines after we've accomplished that. Develop a cultural competence awareness training for all faculty, staff, and administrators. And that is something that we hope to deploy within 90 days and then assist faculty with creating lessons that focus on DEI for their specific program. And we're hoping to do that um, beyond the 91 day mark. Knowing that this is a collaborative effort and it's gonna take different individuals across the departments to help us achieve this goal. Next slide. Good evening, everyone. This is Jennifer Hend um, from the Career Connections Department, and I also staff the Welcome Center desk. So some of the board members I may have met uh, greeting you guys as you come into the College Center atrium. I'll be speaking on this slide for professional development. And as you can see, we've got two topics, uh, two objectives, I should say, that are in the 60-day category and one that's in the 91 plus. So the training certificate for attending various DEI topics is an idea that we have thought to uh, incentivize faculty and staff to uh, participate in DEI topics and gain a greater understanding. The second goal is, the objective I should say, is a DEI goal and development and performance management system. At the moment we are transitioning to a new system and this is why we put this in the 91 plus day category as we need to coordinate and work with the PEC uh, to see this a bit further through. And the last would be a faculty and staff panel, which is, would be similar to the student panel that's been held over the past two years. And the student panel um, is run out of Rolando's area and he had um, students on the panel that represent students of color, DACA, undocumented students, LGBT plus uh, students. And so we wanted to open that up to faculty and staff. Next slide, please.
All right, Reverend, I'm back again. Um, our theme, next theme here is recruitment, retention, and representation. Um, our objective here is to create an Employees of Color Resource Alliance group to retain employees of color. And as some of you may be aware, we are in the process of that and we are kind of got things rolling. Um, and that was an objective that we see that would take place in the next 30 days. Uh, the next one is minority retention, focus on tracking uh, students of color. Uh, this is, um, and, and this one I would say all students of color, there is some tracking, but our goal is to see it as a broader and track all of our students of color. And again, this is one that we would see that would be beyond the, the 90 day. And then the next objective is the data breakdown of minority faculty, staff, and students in all departments and academic programs. And we are currently, um, we've got some data right now looking at data, uh, both from the student and the staff perspective. And this one, we, we put it at the 90 day. Uh, and so it's me again, Jennifer, and I'll be speaking to safety. As you can see, these are all in the planning phases and they've been pushed out to the 91 plus day category. Uh, the first obje objective is to ensure the emotional and psychological safety of the campus community, as opposed to just limiting ourselves to the physical um, safety. The second one would be to ensure the academic safety of the campus community. And what that looks like is to have inclusive content and messaging as well as supporting support programs to address barriers to academic success for students. The last one would be uh, to improve the environmental climate of the campus community. Um, and one of those examples would be to create multiple safe spaces on campus for both students and staff. Next slide, please. And so those are the themes that we um, had created within the 30, 60, 90 day plan to inform our work. Um, we have been using data sources like Rolando referenced, and um, we'll continue to do that to guide where we go in the future. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we have our bias and interviewing online training that um, is going to be system wide that we will deploy on January 1st. So we're really excited about being able to um, provide our hiring managers with some training on how to keep the biases out of um, making hiring, hiring decisions. Um, and we're, we will be using the Articulate system to do that. Um, our DEI training certificate, it's one of those things that we hear from people that they would like to see. And that is to basically offer various types of diversity and educational awareness training. Um, and then as you um, attend multiple of those, you can, you can be rewarded with a DEI training certificate. Um, Jen um, talked about student and employee panels. So again, re-emphasizing re um, the importance of having that voice, whether that's the employee voice or the student voice. Employee exit surveys and interviews, figuring out why people are leaving. Are they leaving because it's that next step in their career trajectory? Or is there something um, innate within the campus culture that we need to look at and try to fix? Campus culture survey and plan of action. Again, figuring out um, what, what people really do think about um, the campus community. And again, what are some ways that we can improve that for everyone? Relying on our WTCS Affirmative Action Compliance Report that gives us the um, yearly employee numbers that we use to kind of determine where, where do we need to go from here? What, what do our faculty numbers look like in terms of the racial diversity? And how does that compare to our student racial diversity? And where are those gaps that we need to make sure that we're filling? And then the equity report that we completed March of this year, looking at um, next year, re, um, revising that plan and rolling that out and seeing where we've made growth, um, seeing places where we still have those gaps that we need to do to work on. Next slide. So I really am very grateful for this Tiger team that you see members here that have really worked over the past five months to put this plan together. Um, I, this work was made possible through them, could not have done all of this by myself, really taking and looking at all of the data sources and all of the information that we had available and really thinking about where do we wanna take this plan and move it into the future. So again, thank this team. Um, for all of their hard work and um, just really appreciate the collaborative team effort that was put forth through this. Next slide. So that's um, all that we have. Do you have any questions for us? Who are the key stakeholders that you'll be bringing this plan in front of to ensure it hits the mark uh, for what they feel the needs are for the university? Yeah, so we um, will be meeting with like our guided pathways team we'll be meeting with our deans and associate deans because when you're talking about the curriculum, they really are heavily involved and wanna make sure that we you know, get the VP of learning and, and get that team on board with what we're doing. Um, like I said, our guided pathways team, 
human resources is going to be big when you talk about recruiting, retaining, hiring um, employees of color, um, and also hiring managers. So working with our college managers, again, to make sure that, you know, they're taking the, the bias and interview training, but really applying what they learn through that. Because it's one thing to deploy this training, but it's another thing to put your, to put what you learn into action. So those are just some of the stakeholders across campus that we'll be working with. Is there any reach out to the student population to see uh, their thoughts on the needs or the focus in which the DEI training should take, whether it be microaggressions or unconscious biases or things like that? Yes, so um, we do have student panels every year um, that we do get that student input and that's kind of a lot of the information that we receive from the student panel we put into the 30, 60, 90 day plan for instance they are the ones who are like, we want to see instructors that look like us. So we knew right. one of the focus of this plan would need to be making sure that we are hiring faculty members that represent our student population. Another thing they talked about was, you know, not feeling safe on campus. And they were very quick to point out, it's not the physical safety, it's that emotional psychological safety that you feel when you get to campus. Um, so again, we, we really have taken their feedback. They wanted some safe spaces across campus. So yeah, we really are using the student voice to kind of guide and, and shape how we further this plan. And then what would there be touchbacks as we develop and work through the plan to ensure that we're meeting the targets or how will that be measured? Yes, we will be evaluating this plan every year to make sure we're seeing what things are going really well. You know, have we met that mark? What are things that we need to make sure that we're improving on? because it is gonna take some time for us to get like curriculum. That is, that's a big, that's gonna be a big baby. So yeah, making sure that we are completing what we set out we're going to complete. Great, thank you. This is really important work. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question kind of um, first following up on um, what you just said and then I have a couple more. Um, in the touchbacks and following up on progress, um, are there, one thing I noticed in this plan, um, I guess, and for me comparing it to the, um, the, the assessment that we had done last year, we did review that in a previous board meeting last year that went over some of the data that we did have and some of the compliance and discrepancies that we had seen, I believe last year. Um, so in the plan that you have currently in this 30, 60, 90 plan, are there going to be more um, identifiable, um, like what does success look like? So it's a big concept to say, like, we want to include uh, more diversity in curriculum, but like, where you're what, like, with by next year, this is what we want to see so that, like, we see what um, that success looks like, like, more identifiable targets within what you've identified in this plan. Like the specific tactics that would make up the overall goal, Julie, is that what you're asking about? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we, um, we will be identifying some metrics to make sure that we, again, are hitting the mark. Because one thing to consider is that, you know, with a higher learning commission accreditation, there are some metrics that we need to make sure that we're meeting to put into that plan. Um, so yes, there are some metri metrics that when we really get down, because the, again, we've only been in this plan for about five months. So once we um, start really infusing the plan into you know, what we're doing across the campus, then we will be able to identify these are the specific targets, the different metrics, and the timeline to complete those. Um, so yeah, we will have some specific metrics that we will be able to circle back with you all and share with you. Okay, because I think, um, like, for example, out of compliance was um, having faculty of Asian descent, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. So like some of those things that we've already known are uh, target areas if we have like um, a measurable around those but and then um, for the safe spaces can you describe a little bit more what the plan is for safe spaces yeah so um, it's just a, an opportunity for students to kind of get away to a, a, a room that's quiet um, that they have to themselves to kind of regroup um, rethink before they move on to the next class or go to a meeting so these safe spaces around campus would be, again, just little areas where a student can just go, whether that's to pray, um, whether that's just, again, to take a breather away from everything else that's surrounding them, but just an opportunity for, some stu for a student to have some one-on-one -on -one private time to do whatever they feel is necessary to regroup, to come back um, 
and be an active participant in the community. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. the, you mentioned the bias training and I was just wanting to clarify for staff, um, there has been some training previous to this, correct? Or correct. Issues? Okay. And then, so the area you've identified is that bias training to make sure it's included. If I understood right. Correct. Okay. Um, and the DEI training certificate, um, is that like a program of the school? Is that what you were referring to with that? Yes, yeah, so it's something that we would create. Um, again, we would put together like 15 different opportunities for employees to take advantage of. And then once they reach like maybe nine, we haven't come up with a specific number yet. But once they reach that specific number, then they would get a, that DEI training certificate to say that they've reached X amount of um, programs to be certified as a DEI certificate winner. Okay, and so that's for employees, so not student, um, not, not for students to take a course on like getting that certificate in DEI training. That is correct, yes. This is okay. just for employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I guess, I don't know if that'd be something to look at as far as being able to provide that for the community. I personally hear that in the work I do with the Hispanic Collaborative Network and people come to us asking for trainers that um, have some um, training in being able to provide the training for, for DEI, and potentially even with the Corporate Training Center collaborating on something like that. Um, I would just say with the exit survey, um, I'm sure you mentioned it as um, being able to identify if they moved for an, um, like advancing in their career or other reasons. And I guess um, the challenge with that, I suppose, is finding out if maybe it's a combination of both. Um, uh, but I thought you did a good job in identifying that. Um, and then um, can you share a little bit about the MRC? What does the Multicultural Resource Center as it um, has been like a hub for um, a lot of these kind of services and student, um, student facing um, efforts around both the inclusion component and um, the attraction of being able to re attract and retain diverse students. Where does the MRC fit into the plan? There, I mean, the MRC will always be a part of what we do with students and it will continue to be a part of our plan. Um, I, I think a lot of our efforts right now is to educate our the, the employees in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion because Rolando has done a great job with the MSMP, the Multicultural Student Mentorship Program, um, running the Multicultural Student Union, the organization that oversees um, the, the various um, ethnic groups that are within the MRC. So I think this is just a continuation and I think it's also gonna complement what has been done in the MRC. So I do see them fitting into this plan. Um, the creation of this office meant that what Rolando did from the student side and what I was doing from an employee side was going to merge together. And we are doing that um, and making that a very seamless transition. So again, I do see them continuing to fit in, continuing to be a part of conversations. And that's why um, a lot of the things that we do, even the DEI standing committee now has a focus on students as well and not just employees that we had in the past. So we really are making that transition from being like two standalone operations into one um, operation that merged together. Okay. Um, and my last question was just, um, and we might have, you might've mentioned this when you um, presented to the, the last meeting, but um, are in the when you come up with the the plan as you continue to develop it, um, are there students that are part of that process? Um, we haven't had students that were a part of the 30, 60, 90 day plan just because of COVID and this online environment that we're in right now. Um, but we do have students that serve on our DEI standing committee, which is a, the committee that's going to pick up a lot of this work that I um, described to you tonight. Um, so there will be some student input in that on that committee that will help continue to shape what the plan will look like. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for your work sharing. Oh, job you're welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Sherry, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just saying thank you, that's all. <laughs> any additional questions for Sherry or any of the team? Well, Sherry, Rolando, Jennifer, thank you very, very much. Um, it's exciting to see everything into, into one spot. I, 
I really like the organization around the five themes and, and the pillars that you're, uh, you're attacking, um, which I think is wonderful. Um, you know, one suggestion I would have um, is there's a lot here and, and just by the nature of it, again, uh, naturally you're gonna see things progress into 60 and 90 day plus categories. Um, we, we may wanna try to make sure we're getting something on the agenda to come back to the group, um, you know, mid-year, you know, let's talk about a time and whether or not you take apart a couple of themes or, or give us kind of a global update, I think it would be really helpful. I think it would be helpful for the board to, to understand and to learn. And it'll be a chance for you guys to show us all the good work that the Tiger team is doing. So thank you very, very much for the work that you're doing. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. With that said, that concludes the uh, open agenda items. At this time, I am going to entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session. This is Michael Weeb. I make a motion pursuant to section 19.851 CE Wisconsin statutes to convene into closed session to discuss the terms and negotiation regarding the new WCTC president's employment contract. Thank you, Michael. Do we have a second on that? Alan Card right. second. Alan, thank you. Um, we're gonna estimate time to reconvene into open session at 6.55, 6.55. Do I have a roll call vote, please, Jennifer? Chairperson Lancaster. Aye. Courtney Bauer. Aye. Michael Weave. Aye. Brian Baumgartner. Aye. Alan Karch. Aye. Tom Mahalski. Aye. Katie Ponsloff. Aye. Julie Valadez. Aye. Very good, motion carries. Jennifer, please take us uh, into closed and we'll reconvene at six. Looks like we're all back, so I can make a motion. Jennifer, we have everyone. Let me just take a quick peek through the attendees here. Yep, we're good. Very good, thank you. We now stand back in open session at 656. Um, at this point in time, I'll entertain a motion. This is Michael Weeb. I make a motion to approve the terms as negotiated and presented for the new WCTC president's employment contract. Thank you, Michael. Do we have a second? Courtney Bauer seconds. You wanna name who that person is? Do you, so yes. you're doing the contract and the hiring of Rich Dr. Barnhouse. Richard Barnhouse. There we go. Mm. <laughs> and we had a second. Courtney. Very good. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote, please. Jefferson Lancaster. Aye. Courtney Bauer. Aye. Michael Weave. Aye. Aye. Brian Baumgartner. Aye. Alan Karch. Aye. Tom Mahalski. Aye. Katie Ponsloff. Aye. And Julie Valadez. Nay. Very good, motion carries. I would like to thank the board for the work that has went into this process and for the effort that's been made. And uh, that does conclude the meeting this evening. So I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Alan Karch, I make a motion for adjournment. Thanks, Alan. Brian Baumgartner, second. Thank you, Brian. Roll call vote, please. 
Jefferson Lancaster? Aye. Courtney Bauer? Aye. Michael Weeb? Aye. Brian Baumgartner? Aye. John Karch? Aye. Tom Mahalski? Aye. Katie Pantloff? Aye. And Julie Valadez? Aye. Very good. Motion carries. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you all very much. Hey, David, do you have a quick second to give me